Well, there's no secret what's looming over all of our heads this week, is it? Another year. And then, right, another year. How many, you know, the kids are like, oh, yeah, another year. And the adults are like, oh, man, another year. Man, they're getting fast, aren't they? I mean, this, is, this, is, this year to me, I think, is the fastest year out of all of the 33 years that I've lived. This is the fastest out of all of them. <laughs> I wish they were only 33, but nevertheless, that's not the point. It's whisked by. And you know, with New Year, when it comes... It's always a sense of renewal. It's something that's, that's precious. It's something that's fun. And, and, and here's the one thing I don't want you to think about. With the new year and, and the first of the year and, and all of this stuff that happens, don't think of that in regards of, as you would think about repentance, okay? A lot of times what we'll do is we'll wait till the first of the year, January 1st, and we'll begin something fresh and something new. Please don't think of repentance in that manner. If you've got something in your life going on that you need to repent of, do it now. Don't wait until the first of the year. That is something when we are convicted and repentance is needed and God grants that, we do it now. But the first of the year, it does offer us something. You know, Anybody make New Year's resolutions? Do you really? What's it going to be? Good. That's, that's how most of us are. We just don't want to admit it. Eh, yeah, we make them, but eh. it's one thing to make them. It's another thing to keep them. But they're kind of neat. And you can call them whatever you want. You can call it a clean slate. But, but I, I tend to look at the new year as a freshness. It's, it's something that, that kind of spurs you on and you want to do things differently. But what's this new year going to bring? Now here's one of my, I'll make a prediction of what the new year, where we stand now, what 2016 is going to bring. Uncertainty. We don't have a clue what's going to happen. But here's some things that might happen. Some of you will be called by God in ways like you have never been called by Him in your life. That may happen this year. Some of you are going to face the greatest challenges of your life. Things that you couldn't even have imagined in 2015, you're going to face in 2016. Some of your faith is going to be tested in ways that you never dreamed of. Persecution of Christians, it's going to increase. So just be aware of that, know that. Anybody who desires to live a godly life in this world will face persecution. Understand that. That's one of the things that we have promised to us as we draw near to that time. And we, we celebrated the Advent, the, the Incarnation, but we're looking forward to the second return of Christ. And understand, the closer we get to that, the more persecution of Christians is going to come. There's going to be losses and there's going to be gains this year. There's going to be change. Church may be called to stand for truth in an unprecedented manner. These are things that might be coming in 2016. They're uncertain days. And so here's what we need to know. Here's what we need to to try to wrap our minds around. How do we act? What do we do facing uncertain days? Open your Bibles to Acts. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. This will kind of be our starting point, but what I want us to do is I really want us to focus because I think we all agree we don't know what's going to happen in 2016. And so in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, I want us to see right off the bat, facing uncertain days, you're not alone. Okay, This isn't something new to, to the church. This isn't something new to humans. I want to see how, in the beginning, the apostles were dealing with uncertain days. Look in Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. It says, And when he had said these things, speaking of Jesus saying things prior to this, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, with a, with a, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Let's pray. Father, I want to yield this time to You because there are things that that we have to have communicated to our hearts today concerning the year to come that the words of man will fail to do this work 
It's got to be you. It's got to be your truth, and it's got to be the Holy Spirit who delivers it to each one of our hearts. You have to convict, Lord. You have to take truth and plant it deep in our hearts. You have to challenge us and change us and mold us and shape us into the image of Christ. So we want to yield this to you today. Speak to us, God, so that we leave here. We're ready to face uncertain days. So teach us this morning, we pray, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So from the text we just read, and it was a short text, and I'll kind of elaborate on it a little bit, the apostles were facing uncertain days. Now, you know everything that had happened with the apostles. They walked with Jesus for three years. And don't just think, you know, that they kind of, you know, He was over there and they were sort of doing their thing. They walked with Jesus. Now, we make reference of that. We walk with the Lord, but they were physically in that sense. And we've talked about really what being a disciple means. Walking behind your teachers to the point where the dust kicks up upon you from Him. That's what they were doing for three years. They walked with Jesus. They trusted Jesus. They failed in their trust. They trusted again. They had placed their faith in Jesus as their Messiah. They saw Him walk on the water. They saw Him raise the dead. They saw Him turn water into wine. They saw Him do all of these miracles. And then they saw Him arrested. And they saw Him beaten. And they saw Him nailed to a cross. And they saw Him die. They saw Him placed in the tomb, and they saw and witnessed on the third day that He had indeed been raised. And so for a 40-day period, He's appearing to them. He's making Himself um, known to them in a physical sense again. And that's where we jump in the text. They've been with Him, and they've seen Him in that resurrected state, in that glorified state, and then He's gone again. Right in front of their sight, He's taken from them. And prior to this, and you can look in your Bibles to this, they question Him about something. They say in verse 6, So when they had come together, they asked Him, Lord, will You at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And they had a question about uncertain days, because here was the thing. They had seen Jesus, and they had seen Him come, and they believed that He was their Messiah. But guess what was still in effect in the Holy Land? Rome. They had not yet been overthrown, so they still have this government looming over them, causing definite uncertain days. And they want to know, Jesus, is this the time you're going to get rid of them? Because we're tired of them. We're tired of being oppressed. We've looked in the Old Testament, and we saw when there was an oppressor, and you raised up a judge, and you took him out, and there was peace in the land. And so they're asking Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They wanted to know because the days were uncertain. They wanted to know because they didn't know what was going to happen in this time when that was about to come. When would it end? And they ask Him that, and then He's lifted up. Right before their sight, He's lifted up. You had to think and try to put yourself in their position. What just happened? You know, here they are. They see Him in a raised state, a resurrected state. They're enjoying fellowship with Him. They know He's alive, and then He's gone. He's taken from them. And I think that they were absolutely in shock to some degree. Look at what happens here. It says, when He had said these things, they were looking on, He was lifted up. And it says, and they were gazing into heaven as He went. You know, they're sitting there and they're staring, and they can't stop staring. And I don't think it was as much as they wanted to to just see exactly what was happening. I think they were astonished. They were shocked at what just happened. But Jesus, again, lived a sinless life, died, raised from the dead, with them again, and then He's gone. We've all felt that. You may feel that. You know when you have family together that you don't see a lot, and then you're either leaving or they're leaving? And you know that feeling in your gut when they're gone? I mean, that's what happens sometimes when people that we love are, have to go back to where they belong. That's what was happening with Jesus. He had to go back to where He belonged, enthroned in the heavens. But what's happening here is they're shocked. They're looking up. They couldn't stop staring into the sky to the point where two angels asked them, why are you doing this? Why are you staring up here? And I think the reason is what they were doing is they were scared and they were uncertain. So here's what I want us to take. How do we face uncertain days of 2016? Okay, because they're, they're uncertain. We're not there yet. We don't know what's going to happen. Realize this, and this is the main thing. 
that although they're uncertain to us, they're not uncertain to God. God knows what's going to happen. God knows what is to come. Jesus already said it, and I read it. So when they had come together, they asked Him, Lord, will You at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And this is Jesus' response. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. See, we don't know what's going to happen. The days are uncertain, they're unclear. We don't know what is even going to happen this afternoon. But the things that are going to happen, we need to remember the Father has fixed these things by His own authority. Now think about that idea of His own authority. With authority comes power. You know, if you just say you had authority but had no power, is that really authority? We know that God is the ultimate authority and He has the authority over all things, so therefore He is all-powerful. God is the ultimate So don't ever forget in 2016 when stuff begins to unfold that you didn't see coming. Because go back to, if you can in your minds, go back to 2014. Go back to that prior to 2015. And then walk through your memory all the things that took place in 2015. How many of those things did you see coming? Not very many of them. But God knows. And God has fixed these things by the authority and within that His power. In God's ultimate authority, He is authority over all the universe, over this earth, over this country, this state, this county, the city, the area in which we live. He has the ultimate authority over your life, over my life. And so we need to consider that and we need to understand and bow and yield to that authority that God has because it is ultimate and it is supreme. In uncertain days, we need to remember that. But look in verse 8. Jesus didn't stop there in saying that all these things are fixed by his, our Father who bought through His own authority, but He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The Holy Spirit. What's the key in, in facing uncertain days? I think it's right there in verse 8. The Holy Spirit. That He is the key of getting through this. Because prior to His death, Jesus spoke a lot about the Holy Spirit. He spoke about the One who was going to come. He repeatedly spoke about this. And this is something interesting. You know, it was to the advantage of the disciples and it was to the advantage of us that Jesus ascended into heaven. It was to our advantage that He went away. Turn in your Bibles to John 16. John 16, verses 4 through 11. We need to see and understand how it is. In John 16, beginning in verse 4, we need to understand how it is of an advantage. Jesus is saying, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to Him who sent me. And none of you ask, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him to you. And then when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in Me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see Me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. It was a great advantage for them to be there with Jesus and see Him literally lifted up in the sky because in so doing, He was going to send forth the Holy Spirit. And He's saying here that if I don't go, then He doesn't come in that capacity. And so thinking of that being the key, the Holy Spirit in your life, His presence being the key to face uncertain days... We've got to yield our lives to the Holy Spirit. I mean, think about this. Think about the Holy Spirit living inside of you. What does that really mean? The Spirit of God living inside of you. I mean, that's a huge thing. Just, just allow your mind to just rest on that for just a moment. Meditate on that. Do what you've got to do to try to take hold of that and really understand we have the Spirit of the living God Almighty God who has ultimate authority, all-powerful, living inside of us. That should blow our minds. That should convict us. That should humble us. 
that should have us rejoicing in all the things that God has done. And so as we face uncertain days in 2016, we've got to yield to the Spirit of God living inside of our lives. And don't think that He's just there camped out, kicked back on the recliners, just sitting around saying, oh, I live inside of you. He's inside of you because He wants to be active in you and through you and active in the world. And He uses us as He does this. He works through us, in us, all of these things. And so as we face these uncertain days, we yield to the Holy Spirit. We let Him carry us where He will. We let Him guide and direct our steps, remembering that the Father has already fixed these things. He's got things planned out. But I want you to go back a couple chapters in John to John 14. John 14 and looking at verses 15 through 18. Another promise of the Holy Spirit. But I want us to see what Jesus is saying here. Verse 15 of John 14, He says, If you love Me, you will keep My commandments. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. And then He says in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. To have the Holy Spirit living inside of us is to have God living inside of us, living through us. To have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that's all God. Okay, we need to remember that. And the Spirit is the one living inside of us. But look at what Jesus says. He'll ask the Father and He will give the Helper, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. This isn't for everybody. Okay, you don't come out these walls and you don't run into people and consider and think, well, I have the Holy Spirit, they have the Holy Spirit. That's not how it works. Who receives the Holy Spirit? It's those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. It's those who have looked at the cross and recognized their own sin against a holy God and realized Jesus is taking all of those sins upon Himself. And then He took those sins and that punishment and He went to the grave for you, for me. And He's been raised from the dead. He's paid the price in full. And so as we come to faith in that, then He gives us the Holy Spirit. Look at what He says. He says it very clearly. You know Him, for He dwells with you. Now at this point, He was dwelling with them. But look at the promise that we now have and will be in you. He's in you. Christian, He is in you. He's in me. Don't take that lightly. You know, we often tend to think, well, I've got I to gotta be in good physical shape. You know, my wife buys me these skinny shirts. I really am starting to hate them. I mean, I could do something right now and you would think I was the incredible hawk because this shirt would be shredded. <laughs> Maybe that's one of my New Year's resolutions, to wear this next year and have it actually fit. But anyway... A lot of times when we think about the Holy Spirit living inside of us, what we do is we begin to think, well, I've got to take care of my body because this is the temple of the Lord. There's so much more about it than just living in a physical sense and having your body in the physical sense being in good physical shape. It is the temple of the living God living inside of you. That's a spiritual thing. It's not just a physical thing, but it is a spiritual thing. There is power involved in that. There is presence involved in that. And I think it does us well to really begin to start thinking along these lines that we have the Spirit of God living inside of us. And Jesus is saying, you're not going to be left as orphans. You know, think of orphans. They're parentless. They're alone. They're scared. They're uncertain. And Jesus is telling His disciples, I'm not going to leave you alone. Now some people view this as, as Jesus merely speaking about His resurrection and after His resurrection He's going to come there and maybe that's true. But I don't think you can also leave out that He's not speaking about the Holy Spirit. I believe He is speaking as well about the Holy Spirit. I will not leave you as orphans. We have the Spirit of God. We're not parentless. We're not powerless. The Spirit of God lives inside of us and is something that the world doesn't get. The believers in Christ, that is what is given upon us. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We're marked with Him. It's a deposit, if you want to call it that, and I've heard some people reference that, and I know I have too, that God has placed in your life that He's going to get a return on. That's what we have in Christ. And Jesus said it. His words. 
You know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. And look at the permanence aspect of this. I will ask the Father and He will give you another helper to be with you forever. Don't ever take those words such a, a, just a cavalier sort of way. When He says forever, guess what He means? Forever. That's why He said it.